They say money can't buy happiness. But if it could, how much do you think it would cost? You see, over the past 10 years, I've made millions of dollars and I've spent millions of dollars and I've given away millions of dollars. And what I've discovered about the relationship between money and happiness, it might just surprise you, but it'll certainly encourage you. You know, growing up in my family, we always had enough, but it was clear that money was a finite resource, right? And how you managed it mattered. I figured the more of it I had, the better off I'd be. So after finishing high school, my plan was simple, become rich and famous. And leading into my senior year of college, I was working really hard at doing just that. I was trying to land a record deal. Cause you see, my dream was to be a famous singer songwriter, make music videos, tour the world. And fortunately for me, I had a songwriting professor in college who really believed in me and he believed in my music. He took me under his wing and he helped me hire session musicians and a producer out of Nashville so that we could record an album that we could shop around to record labels. And I remember being in the recording studio with these incredibly talented musicians working on my music and just feeling on top of the world. Like I was actually making progress on my dream. Not only was I having fun doing what I loved, but I felt supported by my professor and honored and excited to have these real musicians playing my songs and bringing them to life. I even had a cliche photo shoot for the album cover, complete with pictures of me holding a guitar, standing in front of a brick wall or some train tracks, looking deeply pensive and creative. I felt legit. But as we began to hear back from the record labels that I pitched my album to, it became clear that the best I was gonna be offered is what they call a development deal, which means they would sign me as an artist, but they wouldn't pay me until I had developed a bit more basically sold a bunch of albums on my own, proving to them that I was a horse worth backing. Now, as I was newly engaged to be married at the time, this wasn't gonna work. Like I needed to make real money to pay my real bills. And so after years of hard work, my dream came to a screeching halt. And you know the sad irony out of all of this was that the name of my album was Pipe Dream. Well, it was about to get worse because in 2009, and after a couple of years of working in corporate America and in the middle of the Great Recession, my wife and I picked up and moved a thousand miles away from home. We had our first baby, we bought our first house, and then I lost my second job in 10 months. Talk about timing. Now, fortunately, we had some money set aside for a rainy day like this, but as you can imagine, we burned through that money pretty quickly. And eventually, my wife came to me one day and told me about a friend of hers whose husband had lost his job in construction, and they had applied for food stamps. They call it SNAP now. But it was more than enough to cover their groceries each month. So she asked if we could apply as well, and I refused. How could I, someone with a college degree, someone who's worked a job since the age of 14, just wave the white flag and ask the government for handouts? I think like a lot of people who have benefited from this kind of help, I just never in a million years imagined I'd find myself in this situation. Well, my wife's a persistent woman. So two weeks later, she came back to me and asked again if we could consider applying. This time I relented. And with practically zero income, we easily qualified for food stamps, which did help pay for groceries for the next 18 months. Now, during this season, I felt scared. I felt embarrassed, unable to provide. Here I was 26 years old with a wife and a baby and a mortgage. And not only was I not making progress towards any semblance of a career, but I was actually moving backwards. At our lowest point, we were making around $500 a month. And as my wife likes to remind me, we were so broke, we couldn't afford sunblock. And we live in Florida, the sunshine state. I used to feel safe and secure back when I had money in my savings account. 
But now, having spent through all my savings, I felt my grip on what little money we did have getting tighter and tighter. You ever have that feeling? Well, it was in this moment that we were faced with a very specific question. Are we going to continue to give to charity even though we barely have enough money for ourselves? Now for context, back when my wife and I both had stable jobs and a stable income, giving to charity was a regular part of our lives. Like many people with a religious or a faith background, we believed in giving a tenth of our income away to others. And that's all fine and good. But could we really afford to give money now when money was so scarce? This question kickstarted our giving journey. So we did the almost unthinkable. We recommitted to giving 10% of our income away, even though we barely had enough money for food. And in this process, we discovered something surprising. It felt so good to be able to support others, the poor, the marginalized, the hungry, even in the middle of our financial low point. Like our attention was less on ourselves and our frustrating situation and more on the fact that we could still help others. And that felt incredible. Well, it turns out there's science to back this up. You see, those feel-good effects I had when giving, they actually begin in the brain. Stephen G. Post, the director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at New York Stony Brook University calls it the giver's glow. The response, he says, is triggered by brain chemistry in what's called the mesolimbic pathway, which recognizes rewarding stimuli. Now, according to Post, philanthropy doles out several different happiness chemicals including dopamine, powerful endorphins that give people a sense of euphoria, and oxytocin, which is associated with tranquility, serenity, or inner peace. Also, research being done through the Science of Generosity Initiative at the University of Notre Dame has discovered that those who give 10% of their income away report to be 35% happier than those who don't. So there we were, giving 10% of our income away and actually loving it. So we decided to do something even crazier. We committed to giving an even higher percentage of our income away each year, no matter what. It became like a fun game. As my new business began to grow and our giving increased tremendously, it became so exciting to see just how much we could give away and bless others. And I'm happy to report that today, we have reached our bucket list goal of giving 50% of our income away each month, and we're having a ball doing it. But you don't have to give 10% of your income away or even give to a charity at all to take advantage of these happiness benefits. Simply the act of spending some of your money on someone else, what's called pro-social spending, leads to reports of greater happiness and satisfaction. Dr. Elizabeth Dunn, a social psychologist at the University of British Columbia, actually tested this in a simple experiment where participants were randomly assigned to one of four spending conditions, receiving either $5 or $20 to spend on either themselves or someone else. So the participants in the personal spending condition were asked to spend their windfall on a bill or an expense or a small gift for themselves where the participants in the pro-social spending condition were asked to spend their money on a gift for someone else or a donation to charity. At the end of the day, the participants who had spent money on others reported happier than those who spent money on themselves. Interestingly, the amount of money that each participant spent, $5 or $20, had no influence on happiness levels, suggesting that how you spent your money was more important than how much money you spent. According to Dr. Dunn, in order to match the benefits to happiness of giving to charity, you would have to have about twice as much income. And they found this to be true among participants in every income bracket. So here's what I've learned. If you want to increase your chances of happiness, and if you're able to, commit to giving some of your money away. In my opinion, it is the ultimate win-win. Starting today, you could literally be happier 
and make the world a better place at the same time, all by simply giving a portion of your income away. And you can do this in a bunch of fun and unique ways. Here's just a handful of examples of how my family's done this in the past. You know, last year when inflation was on the rise and the cost of gas and groceries was skyrocketing, we went out and bought a bunch of gas and grocery gift cards and anonymously deposited them in mailboxes around the neighborhood. At Christmas time, we've bought Christmas trees for people who can't afford them. When we go out to a restaurant or on a cruise, we purposely over tip the wait staff or the room steward. Giving has been the most fun we've ever had with money. So what about you? How can you increase your happiness? Well, starting today, if you're able to, pick a charity or a cause that you're passionate about and commit to donating at least 1% of your income to it each month. If that's too much of a stretch, then simply start by buying coffee for a friend or paying for someone's meal next time you're out with people. Just make the mental commitment to give. And if you're already giving, consider raising your standard of giving this year. In fact, if you're able to, you could pick a target percentage that you'd love to reach one day and steadily increase your giving each year until you hit that goal. Imagine if all of us committed to giving a bit more of our income away each year. Imagine what kind of good we could do. Imagine what kind of world we could create. And at the same time, imagine just how much happier we'd be ourselves. You know, King Solomon, one of the richest people to ever walk the face of the earth, said 3,000 years ago, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. And he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. My hope is that you will find refreshment in refreshing others.